Joining us now, she's in her 21st season as head coach at Notre Dame, fresh off their 22nd straight NCAA tournament appearance, 12th regional final. I speak of Coach Deanna Gump joining us here back on In the Circle. Coach, how you doing? Hi, Eric. I'm great. How are you doing? Doing fantastic. Uh, let's kind of revisit last year. You made a great, uh, you had a 33 and 15 season. You yeah. got to a regional final with it, a win away of the super regional. When you reflect back on last season, considering all the obstacles uh, that everybody went through in 2021 season, uh, what, yeah. what, what, what comes to mind for you? The first thing that comes to mind about last season is how incredibly proud I am. Um, to this minute, I still brag about our team because, you know, last year it was it was tough. Um, and you know it. We all know it. We all know how brutal last season was. Um, and I, I'm so incredibly proud of our team, the way that we the way that the girls handled the whole season. I mean, we you know, it, it, it was the, the travel was horrendous. Um, the, the conditions that we played in at times, it was brutal. We, ne we were never even in the same locker room the entire season. And I'm just so proud of the team and proud of, of just how we handled everything. I mean, we, we had to drive home twice, more than 14 hours um, because our flights were, you know, gone and, you know, we, we canceled. And so, and, and how they handled it and, you know, keeping those N95s on the mask for 14 hours, that's just not fun. Like there, a lot of things were, it, it was crazy. But the first thing that comes to mind is incredibly, I'm so, so proud. Um, it, it, it was really amazing. And, you know, from the standpoint, you know, you get to that regional. First of all, it was one of the toughest regionals in the country yes. where you have Northwestern's a four. You got yes. Kentucky as the host. And oh, by the way, you got, you draw Miami of Ohio has one of the best mid-major pitchers in the country in, uh, in, in Velestria there with coach Kumar and the great job they've done there at Miami yeah. of Ohio. They got a stacked team. There was, that was a, like, I, you know, I use the term in they use this in the world cup in soccer, the group of death in some, in it's, it's to some extent. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, you know, I saw that regional, I'm like, okay, it's anybody's ball game that talk about a region of four that could have gone any way. And it wouldn't have surprised anybody. Um, Miami of Ohio, they're so good. And I'm telling you that pitcher can pitch for anybody in the country. She's so good. And the way that Corinne um, just took that team and, you know, they just, they play, they were playing so, um, so well. And I, I gotta be honest, like, I'm glad we had them in the first game um, because I think we got them with some nerves. So, you know, I, I, I they, they're just so good. Um, and then Northwestern and the four seed, that's the craziest thing you've ever heard. Right. <laughs> <laughs> a team that was like in the sweet 16 like uh, in the super regionals two years ago with danielle yeah. williams as a pitcher yeah and the same team pretty much <laughs> so like did all, did all you coaches like laugh at each other when you like did like your coaching like i mean i couldn't imagine what went through all your minds there well the first thing we said when we saw you know the four coaches were like you know what this is one of those regions and it's anybody's ball it's anybody's ball game and it really was i mean the scores of the games it was crazy watching it you know the whole thing just just the whole thing unfold it was it was pretty nuts but it was it was a fun regional and it was a good regional and um i'll tell you what if i could if i could change that last day for my team i would because that one it, it was brutal um you know losing those two games that last day against kentucky when we played so well against them the day before i tipped my hat to kentucky and rachel i thought she prepared them perfectly to play us and i think that it was it was one of the hardest days I've ever had to coach um, at the end of that day to me. It was when we walked off that field and losing those two ball games. Um, I haven't felt that way. Probably I'd say 98 percent of my career. It, that one hurt pretty bad and because we had a team who could do it. We had a team who could be a sweet 16 team and um, we were right there. I guess the positive thing is we're hungry and I have a bunch of girls at Notre Dame right now that are hungry and believe that we can do it. Well, and that's a, a positive is you return a lot of players from that team. It's not like you're starting over. You've got a lot of the returners back who had to go through that painful Sunday. Is that what, what, how do you, is that the message? Is that what you hope they kind of learn from that experience is you gain that experience as a positive moving forward that, 
hey, we don't want to go through that again. We know we can get to, you know, past regionals, get to the supers, et cetera. Uh, and now we know what it takes having gone through it, being that close and feeling that pain. We don't want to go through again. Yes, I, I that's exactly the message we had the last day we were together after that game was over. I had I really just let the girls talk because I knew how painful it was and I knew there was nothing I could say to make them feel better. Um, so they got to, you know, I just said, I'm with you guys and I wish it was different and we just didn't play well enough to win that, that last game. But it was, like you said, it was extremely painful and we have learned a lot. And now we're focusing way more on the mental side of the game than the physical, because physically we're good enough. It was, um, do we believe we should have been there at the end and, and what did we need to do to take it? And I believe it's a hunt. I believe that it's just as it's, it's tactical, it's physical, it's technical, and it's mental. And I think where we fell short was mental. Do you think it was one of those cases where some of the players like played not to lose instead of trying to win, like maybe the earlier in the tournament? Because sometimes that happens with teams, you know, they don't think uh, too much of it. The next thing you know, hey, we're this close, let's not, you know, lose it. Well, I think pretty much like what you said, I just think that they start thinking about it yeah. instead of just playing, like stop thinking, you know, the, what, the one thing I wish the w gift I wish I could give them is don't think about it, just play. But I think we were thinking about it. Yeah. And, but that, that comes with experience. You can't like, yeah. no matter how much you could practice, you could talk to them about it. Unfortunately, you know, sometimes as a player, you have to go through it, right? Like, yeah. you, Yes. I got it. I totally agree. And a lot of your players have done that and now they come back. So let's talk about this team now. You return a lot of players. Let's start yeah. offensively. Abby Sweet, obviously, 445, five homers, 23 RBIs, 712 slugging, 20 steals. Was part of an offense that hit 299. Uh, Emma Clark, 404 average. Gaskins hit 10 homers. Just talk about your, you know, let's start with your offensive veterans and leading the way because your offense was dynamic last season. I, I agree. I, I think that my favorite thing about our offense is the fact that we were very balanced. We had power, we had speed, um, and we, we, had, we could do a little bit of everything. Um, and I, I like being able to have a nice balanced lineup. And I think we're even better this year. I think we have a, a, you know, I think we have a little more power. I think we have a little more speed. And I think we have a little more of those, those playmakers that kind of create chaos. And I love the fact that our offense can create chaos. You know, we're not gonna have eight girls who are gonna hit the ball out. Um, and I don't want that. That's not how we play the game here at Notre Dame. Um, but we have a, every single player on our team can create chaos. And that's yeah. what I love. Much chaos and the balance, I think, is what you're looking for there yeah. from an offensive standpoint. Do you have you feel you have enough protection, for example, for an Abby Sweet uh, uh, in the lineup? Yeah, I think we have more protection for her this year, um, which I, I think people could work around her towards the end of the year. You know, she wasn't walking it. You know, if you looked at her walk ratio, it's still minute, right? Um, but she was at a point last year where I think she had one walk going into like the end of April. <laughs> and so people just started pitching around her because they're like, well, she'll, she's going to swing at a bad pitch. Well, she had to change her mentality because people didn't throw her strikes anymore. So she started getting her walks, you know, got a lot of hit by pitches. That comes with the territory. Um, and then who was going to, who was going to produce behind her? You know, Emma Clark did a great job for us. Karina did a great job for us. But I'm really, you know, there's a couple more hitters in there that I, I think Sarah Gens is, it, she's such a quiet hitter um, and people don't expect a lot from her. And she just comes in and her last half of the season was incredible. So I can't wait to see, you know, how she, you know, how, what she does in there. And, you know, I think we're going to have Jolie Mitchell back. She's that kid that you're like, hmm, this is interesting. What can she do for us? She hasn't had a full year, you know, ever. So she's back and she's recovering from injury. And, you know, another one that's not a sleeper that people don't talk about too much, but I think the one who plays, talk about the kid who gets a dead in pressure is Leah Hanks. Like she has, she's the kid that, she can hit the long ball. She create, creates chaos on the bases and she can, you know, she puts it, she can just dump the ball and play and take off. So I, we have more protection, which is good. You mentioned Hanks, 314 average, five homers, 27 RBI. Is this the deepest uh, offense lineup wise, uh, you know, from a depth standpoint you've had? Yes, without a doubt. Wow. I can, I can tell you without a doubt that, um, I, we keep talking as coaches, we're like, gosh, 
we don't know who's going to start still because <laughs> we have these hitters, you know, we have some freshmen that I'm like, what the heck, you know, Jane Cronenberg, she's uh, watch out for that one. I mean, it's just, it's so fun to see where it's all going to land. I don't know. We'll see. You mentioned obviously a new face you just mentioned there. How do you blend in the new faces with all this kind of a veteran roster, if you will? We it's do. a deep, it's one of their deepest rosters too. Yeah, we, we do have a veteran roster. I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, after this, you know, we kind of wrapped up team practice last week. And the one thing, my message to the freshmen when I met with them is, okay, now you know what it's like. Now you know what to expect. And I don't, act, I, I expect you to never act like a freshman on the field. You've been there, you've done it, and now it's time to produce. And I had one freshman say, you know what, this team doesn't even know what I'm capable of doing yet. I'm like, well, then prove it. So I, I really hope that, you know, these freshmen come along and, and do big things because if that happens, poof, we, we've got, we've got, we have a lot of fun coming up. Oh, you know, talk about some of the new faces that may contribute in some ways to this uh, team, especially, you know, either offensively or pitching wise, who's some of the new faces to keep in a, to remember the name if you're an Irish fan. Yeah. Shannon Becker um, is one that you're going to see. Um, she's going to become a very familiar face very quickly um, because we have only three pitchers on staff. Well, we have a roster of 23 with three pitchers. So we have 20 position players. So um, we've had a couple of big injuries that we've lost a couple of um, players due to their career ending injuries. So we went from a, a, a pitching staff of five to three. Wow. So, yes. So we have three girls. It's going to be Shannon Becker, freshman, who is going to have a ton of innings, Peyton Tidd and Alexis Holloway. That's our staff. And we're going to roll with all three of them. And they all know it, and they're super excited about it. Well, the good news is, if uh, that's pretty good arms to have. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, it's not like, oh no, you got to throw Alexis Holloway and Peyton, uh, you know, more often. Like they combined to win Darn twenty-nine it. games. Yeah, rough problem there, coach. And boy, Becker, what a rough two pitchers to learn from, huh? No. Yeah, and they have. I'm so proud of them um, because they've completely taken her under their wing. I mean, they just they have those three just have a blast together. Um, they have created their own little their own little world um, that they're just living in it, and um, they're having some fun. So it uh, Shannon's definitely someone that is going to be a big name for us and going to have a lot of production. Um, yeah, you know, like I said, Jane Cronenberger playing some second base for us. Um, Anna Holloway um, in the middle infield as well. You know, we haven't made a decision on middle, in, middle infield yet. Um, and those were our two super seniors last year, second base and shortstop um, that ended the, uh, the year. So those are the two open positions that y- y- we're like, we'll see. We'll see what happens. And we have two freshmen who, who are fighting like heck to get in there. That's an incredible story. We're speaking with uh, Coach Deanna Gump here on In the Circle. You, let's, I mean, we kind let's kind of dive into the pitching since we've kind of teased them a little bit. Holloway and Peyton Tidd, one-two punch. A Holloway, 14 wins, 279 ERA. Peyton, 15 wins, 240. She led you in wins. I don't know if people that didn't follow the program on a daily basis would realize that because uh, yeah. for whatever reason, I think Holloway, and rightfully so, gets a lot of attention, but Peyton was just as good. I mean, you've got co really. Yes. Yeah, there's not – yeah, it's a one-one punch in my mind. I think it's been like that. Um, you know, I think they are – I think we're so lucky because they are like sisters out there. You know, they work so well together that they're almost better together than they are single. So, you know, one with 14 wins, one with 15 wins, and they could easily um, go the other uh, go the other way. They they're just so similar in their approach and how much they love to work together. Where and it's so fascinating because you got Becker now coming in as the freshman. I mean, it's almost like a passing of the baton, if you will, right? Teach them the knowledge for the next one and building that tradition, yep. right? Yep, that's the plan. That's their plan for sure. Who who's the like of Holloway and Peyton? You said they're very similar. Is one more vocal than the other? How are they from a a leadership standpoint? Is one more like likes to just do it based on it by example? Is one more of a vocal type? How are they from that standpoint? I would say. Um, Holloway is more vocal. Um, you know, she's more, you, she's more emotional. I would say out there, you're going to see her get excited. You're going to see her be feisty. You're going to see her get after it. Peyton is very, um, I would say 
I would just say very stone-faced. She's not going to let you know what she's thinking. She's not going to let you know what she's feeling. And she approaches every single hitter the exact same way. So they're very different in that way. You mentioned, I think, during the season, I think one of the media availabilities might have been the regionals too, that uh, this was one of your favorite groups you've coached in all your years. What What is it about this group? Because most of them are back. Obviously, you you don't have everybody back. And Marino, for example, did, obviously grad, you know, moved on, had a great career. But yeah. what is it about this core that you like so much that, I mean, I can even hear it on your voice. I mean, you're, yeah. you're, excited. you're ready to go now with this team, aren't you, right now? <laughs> Yeah, I really am. Um, I, you know, I've, we were just talking to the coaches last week and I just, I love this team. I, you know why? Because they care about each other so much. Um, they work hard for each other. They're working hard on the field together. They work hard for each other. They're working hard off the field for each other. They are, they want to be around each other all the time. It, it's just a special team and it doesn't happen all the time. And you can't force that. You can't make that happen. It's all on them and it's all about what's important to them. But this team really loves each other and they like to be around each other. They'd like to be around us, <laughs> which is really fun. Um, and they like to have a good time. And I think that we play not very many um, teams. I mean, think about how many college teams play 56 games a year, right? So we have to get along. We have to appreciate each other and love each other. And um, this is a fun team to be around. And a team that probably was the right team at the right time to handle everything everybody's gone through, right? The last two years, I'm sure that's part of it as well. It's for sure part of it. And, you know, I, I'm, I got to believe they're, you know, and, you know, with the, with the portal even exploding and, you know, it's part of our game now, like it's real. Um, but it, I'm pretty proud of this group because you don't, you don't see them in there. They don't, they, they want to be around each other. They want to stick together. And I, I think that's one thing I'm so incredibly proud of with our, with our group is they they're staying and they want to be together and they want to do it together. So I love that. Let's talk about the ACC, which is, uh, I think it's getting stronger by the minute. It seems like uh, you look at last season, Florida State within a win away of winning a, a national championship they, they, there in the, in the World Series. Clemson wins the regular season title. Duke wins the ACC tournament. And they're a national team. Virginia Tech gets to the Super Regionals. I mean, this league was stacked. And yet, and I've talked to other coaches, and I'm curious your thoughts. I feel like you, there's a chip on the shoulder among the coaches and the and some of the in, in the league about hey we're not getting our just due here like duke got to you know i talked to coach young they got to be a national seat but they had to travel clemson mm -hmm. i just spoke to coach ripman he didn't you know they didn't get to host so is there a bit of a chip on the shoulder within the league to say hey we're you know we're got a strong league here give us a little more respect yeah i, I definitely think there is um but the the problem is is our conference has known how good we are we, this isn't out of the blue. Like, I mean, look at Clemson's not out of the blue. Duke's not out of the blue. They've been good since the minute they, before they even became part of our conference before, you know, when they were starting with recruit girls, you knew, you knew how good they were going to be. Virginia Tech, Pete has been building this program at VTech and Lonnie, are you kidding me? Like she's, she's top five in the country all the time. So in my mind, like, I don't think this is anything new. I, so there's your chip. We've known this. We've known how good this conference is. It's well, I don't know why it's taking other people a long time to figure it out because we're getting it done. I agree. I mean, there's no reason why the ACC cannot be a multi-bid host no, conference. And that's kind of what I'm referring. Like you've hosted, uh, Florida State's hosted, but that's really been it recently. Yeah. And, and I feel yeah. like there and should have been more. Sense. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you 100%, Eric. It, it just doesn't make any sense. We should, we have five legitimate hosts in our constantly, constantly. Yeah. And the facilities have been increased. And we've seen, I mean, Clemson's got a beautiful facilities. You've got a great facility. Just talk about the facilities, because I don't, I think that might be one of the things that's kind of under the radar. Maybe people haven't kind of, you know, uh, uh, maybe have slept on from the ACC. I mean, the facilities have gone up a different level there uh, that's helped the competition, not to mention, obviously, ACC Network. So more of the games are on now and more exposure. Right. That's what I was going to say. It, it's our facilities. It's the ACC Network. 
It is, I mean, and what the facilities are doing is people are people are seeing it now, right? Like seeing it on TV, like, wow, I didn't know it was like that out there. Um, and, you know, people are starting to figure it out a little bit, but I still don't think it's at the pace that it should be. I mean, there's, like I said, we, we could have had four hosts just last year. I don't, you know, I don't think we should have hosted. I don't think we earned that, but that's our goal. You know, that's our goal every year is to host a super or host a regional tournament because that's what you want to do. It gives you the best shot to win it. So, like I said, there should be five of us. <laughs> well, and I agree. And 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 I will kind of paraphrase. Beth Mowen said this on a selection show a couple of years ago. I think the committee, and it's a difficult job. I've spoken to them. So there's a lot of variables. I do think if you win your conference, that has to mean something. Like Clemson winning the regular season title has to mean they should be able to host. Duke winning the ACC tournament should mean they should be able to host. Uh, I think that, to me, if nothing else, that should be part of it. Like if if you're debating on who to host, if you win your league, especially a strong league like the ACC, that's I think the the to me that was one I had the biggest problem with personally. Yeah, those were two no brainers. Yeah, I, I I'm sorry, but Clemson Clemson and Duke hosting last year, those are two no brainers. Yeah, and for them to get slighted that way, it just it was wrong. And, and I don't think anybody's afraid to say that. I think everybody realizes that, um, you know, it's easy to say that after the fact, but I hope right. that people realize that and kind of keep that in the back of their mind this year. I agree. I'm curious because uh, you're one that has been at times put in a regional because of the 400 mile radius, but at yeah. times you've also been sent out West. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Do you have a preference? Do you think the 400 mile radius should be taken out uh, from the process and just seat it naturally, regardless of travel? Where, where do you stand on that as somebody that's experienced both? Yeah, we, we have, I mean, we have our typicals, right? We have the, the ones we typically go to and then we have the random West Coasters. Um, but I think that it should be completely by seeds. Completely, I think throw the throw the distance out of the window and if i'm number 17 in the country then i should be with the number 16 team right yep. and i think if i'm number 18 in the country i should be with this 15 team and so on like i think it i think it should go all the way down just uh, complete just seat them the way it should be by I strength of schedule I think you and I are on a hundred percent agreement. I say we should just be, we should just include us in the committee there. We can help. We can make, we can fix this. I would this love code. to help out. <laughs> uh, let, let's talk about a couple other things. Um, I want to ask you about a former player of yours, Megan Bartlett, who's now the assistant at Texas. Uh, give me a, give me a funny Megan Bartlett story here. Cause oh I, we, cause that, I'm sure there you've got one that you can, you're allowed to tell that she won't get mad at you for, but like, because well, she's, uh, obviously, she's now at Texas coaching under Coach White. Uh, so it's got to be a little weird that you don't see her as often now on the Midwest, but you probably see her on the recruiting trail still because you're all probably going after similar players and things like that. Yeah, luckily, I get to see her um, definitely recruiting and when, we at, when we're at the same places together. Um, Megan, first of all, I have to keep it appropriate with Megan. I got to think of something <laughs> <laughs> not inappropriate. <laughs> that could, could be tricky. <laughs> it could be tricky. I'll leave it at that. Oh man, she is as a player. I just remember one time she kicked a bat because she had lost it about something. Did you see her get tossed uh, last season in Austin, where she was arguing and got tossed from the Oklahoma State series? I, I, I believe you saw the highlight clips of that. I saw the highlight clips, and um, it was sent to me probably twenty times from my alumni. <laughs> Did you reach out to her? Did you like give her like, what, what, did. what'd you, oh boy. Did you give her a riot act there? What'd you do? I just said, oh, Megan. <laughs> That's all you could say. That's what fair. do you say? Yeah. It's Megan. Um, no, she's great. She is, you know, she's the one, she's the, she's the emotional player that, that's why she was so darn good. And I mean, granted she could run um, and she, ha she could do everything well. Um, she, she was just an amazing athlete for us and a dynamic hitter for us. Um, but boy, I think why she was so good is because she just, she, she's such a passionate, passionate player. And that's why you get the, the very worst and the very 
sarcastic part. <laughs> right, fair, good words. Good words. I like your vocabulary on that. Uh, what's the biggest advice you give coaches? Because obviously she's not alone. You've had others that have, you know, either that have been on your staff or have played for you, they've gone into coaching. What's the biggest advice you give? Oh, boy. Um, I would say the one thing that I, I try to help them with is to always know it's never it's really never as good or bad as it seems in the moment um, because it's such an emotional roller coaster coaching, coaching and, you know, being a mom and um, you know, having significant, uh, significant others and trying to balance it all out. I think the biggest thing you, you just have to keep on yourself is everything's going to work out and it's never as good or bad as it seems in that when in that one moment. Um, because, you know, the moments in this, in this profession, it feels like everything is just the worst thing that could ever happen, but really it's not. And then there's moments in this profession where you feel like nothing could ever, like it's the greatest moment of your life, but it really isn't. So somewhere in the middle is the right way to handle everything. Do you, uh, coach Ravel, when I had her on, she said that she feels like part of the responsibility is to give back to the game, help other coaches, help and you know pick, give them their advice pick their mind but she also says hey i'm not a, i'm not shy i'll ask others for advice too and pick their brains uh, do you feel the same absolutely and i mean she's one of my favorite people in this whole world because um we're just I, i'm on a total different level with her i go to her on those tough days you know she might be one of my first phone calls that i that i make um because she is she's what a special woman she is huh yeah. Um, Ronna Ravel is incredible and she is all that is good in, in our game because she cares so much about all the things you just talked about, you know, other people giving back, um, being positive, being a resource for others. Like she is, she is awesome. And I feel so lucky that I get to be part of her circle sometimes. What's the biggest thing you learned from her? Gosh. There's so many things I learned from her. I, you know, I think that the game's never more important than people. And um, I, I think she is, she is a pure example of caring about people. People come first. It's pretty good. It's pretty good to learn there. Uh, yeah. Last thing, uh, we'll leave you on this. Uh, Obviously, between now and February, you know, before your season gets going, what are going to be some of the keys for this team uh, to accomplish its internal goals? What are some of the key factors and maybe questions uh, that they got to address uh, to to accomplish their goals? I think for this team to accomplish their goals, um, they have to stay in control of the game. And that doesn't mean that we can't give up runs. That doesn't mean that we can't make mistakes. It's about really just staying in control. And being able to punch back when you've been punched. So, um, you know, I, I think that is, is probably the most simple answer, but probably the most realistic is slow it down, stay in control and um, know how good we always are because we're good. Really good. And I think a lot of people are excited about this season coming up for the Fighting Irish. Coach, always a pleasure to have you on. It's a, it's a blast to talk to you. Uh, especially here on the Zoom deal. So now we actually get to see each other instead of- Right, uh, I think the, the, this is great. Thank you, Eric. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, this is a good tradition. Hey, I, thank you. Uh, thanks for everything. We'll be in touch and uh, we'll definitely do this uh, again soon. All right, that sounds wonderful. You take care and have a have a wonderful holidays.